Hi everyone. Um, so now the official welcome. Welcome to the uh, March 31st Adoption and Engagement Forum for Open Active. Uh, thank you for joining us today and spending your time uh, learning uh, and listening to people talking about uh, sport data and Open Active. Um, I think the first thing that I would like to do is the usual reminder uh, for people who are either new or slightly uh, or, or forgotten about our Slack channel. Um, we have an open active Slack, uh, which is open to anyone to join. Uh, the, the link to it is in the slides and we'll put it in, in, the, in the, the deck when we publish it. Um, but on Slack, we have an AEF forum where there is some conversation happening. Uh, you're welcome to join that. Um, also, uh, after this call, we'll publish the video uh, and the slides openly so that you can go back and look at the content and hear what people have, have said today. In terms of the agenda today, um, we've got Ross Gehring joining us, who's going to talk about the Squash Player app uh, and the work he's been doing to improve the availability of data around Squash. Uh, we've got uh, Liz, uh, Liz Clark from Sport England, who's going to tell us all about active places. Uh, and then Charlie's going to give us a quick update on the steering committee. Um, and the steering committee was yesterday uh, and they had quite a lot of discussion about uh, governance. Um, so just before we kick off, uh, what I'd like to do is a quick round of introductions. Um, so I'll just go around in the order people are on my screen. So I, I, I'll start. Um, I'm Andrew Newman. I'm the Principal Data Specialist at the o Open Data Institute, and I am responsible for Open Active at ODI. Uh, Julie, I'll come to you next. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, Julie King. So I'm Delivery Manager for the Open Active Project, working with the internal team and Sport England as well. Cool. Liz. Hi everyone, so I'm Liz Clark, Head of GIS at Sport England. Thanks Liz. Uh, Adam? Hi everyone, um, I'm Head of Digital Innovation at Sport England and work on the Sport England side of Open Active. Uh, Ross? Yeah, I'm Ross Gehring of the Squash Players app, uh, also CTO of a web company in, uh, in Australia and a travel startup called Abroadly. Uh, thanks, Kanika. Hello, I'm Kanika Joshi. I work as an impact manager with ODI, and I also work on the Open Active Project as a um, monitoring evaluation lead. Thanks. Uh, Baden. Hey, I'm Baden. I work on the uh, what is now Everybody Moves Project, more was uh, Parasports at uh, Paralympics GB. Thanks. Uh, Grace. Hi, I'm Grace. I work for Somerset Activity and Sports Partnership as their Open Data Project Officer. Thank you. Charlie. Hi there, uh, Charlie, director at Playfinder Powering Book Tech and representing from the Open Active Steering Committee. Thank you, uh, Dominic. Yeah, that, <clears throat> that, yeah, I think that's me. Um, Dom from IMEN, one of the co-founders. Thanks, Dom. Uh, Jules? Hi, good morning. I'm Jules from York Sport Foundation, another active partnership. Hooray. Excellent. And last but not least, I think Tom. Hi everyone, Tom Marley played, um, yeah, consume and publish open data. Excellent, thank you. Um, so I think that's everyone. I don't think I've missed anyone. Um, if I have, I'm sorry. Um, what I'm gonna do now uh, is hand straight over to Ross Gehring, who's gonna tell us all about the Squash Player app and the work he's been doing with that. Okay, so I can uh, uh, share screen now. I should be able to. Yep, we should be able to. Cool, let's give this a go. Um, can't yet. It's saying I can't share while the other participant is sharing. Okay, I will stop. There we go now. Yeah, I think that should work. Screen one, screen two. Right, let's give that a go. Right, can you see my web web page? Yeah, I can. Thank you, Ross. Cool. Okay, I'm going to be juggling a few technologies and <laughs> and and live demo type things today. So. Uh, um, if it all goes smoothly, it'll be a small miracle here, but we shall see. So, uh, yeah, okay. So, um, yeah, I'm the uh, um, uh, founder of, uh, of this um, sort of privately funded startup, a bit of a passion project called the Squash Players app. Um, and uh, in in essence, or what it what it does right now, as as uh, this moment in time, it contains the biggest and best um, database of um, squash venues and courts on the planet, um, largely thanks to crowdsourcing, which is sort of an integral part of what we're doing. Um, if, I, if I drag this on, onto your screen, can you, can you see that? 
that the app? Yeah, you can. Great. Okay, that's good. To, that's 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 comforting. That's good. Okay. So, um, I just thought um, if you want to, I've got a, three trivia questions just to wake you up this morning. Um, so uh, it, it's um, just to uh, yeah get the ball rolling here. So the, the first question is so you want to have make sure you unmute yourself. So um, which which country in the world has the most squash courts per capita? Anyone? I'm going to say Egypt. Nope. No, lots of players, not so many courts. Oh, the US. Nope. It's going to be somewhere weird, isn't it? Like, I don't know, India well, or Dubai. The, or the male, like someone reached, um, someone from this country reached number one briefly in the rankings recently. Ah, I'll give it to you, New Zealand. But that's, that's in terms of countries, but the, um, if you go to dependencies like Gibraltar, then you've got little dependencies like um, um, the Falklands or Norfolk Island off Australia, which are actually uh, the, the top. But anyway, um, next question is, um, which um, country has the venue with the most squash courts? Sorry, yeah, the venue with the single venue with the most squash courts. No idea. Well, someone who works in facilities, I'm embarrassed. So. <laughs> it's in it's in Poland. It's got 32 courts in the Asta La Vista Center. And uh, last but not least, I've got a, um, a a trick question for you. And I think uh, one or two of you in discussions might have heard this already. What's the lowest squash court in the world in terms of height above or below sea level? I'm going to say either Dubai or the Netherlands. There's two two uh, tricks in the in the in the title there. C There's got to be one underneath the sea in Dubai. Yes, <laughs> below sea level, and it's the Titanic. At <laughs> not, I didn't say operational. <laughs> Three thousand eight hundred meters below sea level, which happens to be coincidentally the height the, of the highest court above sea level in Bolivia. Um, anyway, so that was a little little bit of trivia for you. Um, Okay, so a little bit of um, uh, background to the app. So um, uh, a few years ago, my company, um, Itomic, um, we were looking to get more into mobile app development. And uh, we, we were having a good look at the um, different technologies for that. And we found a technology, a new one in, in beta called um, Flutter by Google. And um, I've got a um, screenshot of it here somewhere. Oh, I, just, I can't move that tab. That's all right. I'll try and do this. Yeah, Flutter, so is the technology behind the, the mobile app. It's backed by Google. So we want to have a take this for a spin. I used to develop um, Squash League management systems some years ago, and I had sort of unfinished business with Squash. And um, so we gave this for a spin. And I said, oh, let's try and let's try and build a simple um, um, sort of record book, you know, logbook for keeping Squash scores, just to have a play with the technology. And of course, a logbook is, um, you know, who you played, when you played, what the score was, and where did you play? Um, and the first three are, you know, pretty straightforward between the, the players. Um, but um, the fourth one is um, where did you play? And um, and we're like, okay, well, how do we make sure? Being a, a data purist, I didn't want to. I wanted to make sure that people were recording it at the, the same venue, not like different random addresses for the same place. Um, so I went in search of, um, you know, good quality um, sources of, of squash venue data, and I found it really lacking on a global scale. So. Um, you know, two, three of the of the top countries in the world, be England, Australia, not too bad. Um, but then it falls off a cliff rapidly. Um, so you have things like, I mean, this is a um, one example. This, this is the World Squash Federation. So they have a total of 14 courts for the UK um, on their database. That's a yeah, just a, a very poor example of um, very lacking data, you know, from the very top level. Um, also, some very, um, very poor statistics generally about squash, we, we noticed. So, for example, one of the biggest jokes in squash, I'm, I'm, I mean, I love squash, can't play anymore, dodgy ankle. Um, but um, one of the big, biggest uh, yeah, jokes in squash is that uh, on Wikipedia, it says that there are about 20 million people who play squash regularly, maybe about 20 years ago. Um, unfortunately, it's a, a lot less than that. I think it's probably closer to, oh, yeah, three or four million, maybe. Um, but uh, yeah, so generally uh, we've noticed a really big um, you know, lack of decent data in, um, <clears throat> with squash. So, um, so what we said about building was we thought, okay, um, how are we gonna improve this situation? And we, we decided that crowdsourcing 
um, was the best way to, with engaged communities to help us um, add venues um, in, into the app. Um, now I'm the uh, I'm just seeing if I can screencast. It's still going on and off again. Uh, let's give it a go if I can. If it doesn't work first time. I'm going to um, abandon it. But let's things and yay, it's back on. Right. Da -da 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 -da. Let's pull it over here. Um, <clears throat> so so yeah, look it. Um, Here's the app on my screen right now. I've got it preloaded on, on uh, it just shows you the local courts. Um, well, to phys physically where I am right now. Um, made it super easy to add anyone to add courts. Notice that you know we, we've definitely gone for the whole mobile first thing. So you can't actually add um, courts via a web uh, interface right now. It's all through the, the app. So I'm just gonna click on the, the plus button, bottom, bottom right. Um, so what it does is first of all, it's hooking into the um, Google Maps uh, or Google Places API. Um, so, what it, so yeah, what you're getting here is straight from Google Google Places. It's, it's doing a bit of a bit of pre-filtering, not as much as we'd like, um, but it helps to sort of not show you everything. So, um, anyway, I'll, I'll pick one here. So I'm going to pick um, Bournemouth University just to show. Let me give this one a go. So what you what you can see here when I pick that from the list, it's instantly pulling in the base data, which is all grayed out from um, Google Maps. Um, it's worked out that it's um, in fact a in the category of college or university, and then you can add more information if you like. But if you do nothing else, that's all you do. You pick from the list and go. That's it done. Um, if you choose to add extra data, great. Um, obviously, we'd like to know how many courts it's got, that sort of thing. But um, that's that's optional. So I can just click click add venue here, and it's now gone into um, you know manual review. Uh, let's move this. Oh, well, actually, while I've got the screen up, um, I'll just bounce over to. Uh, it's got some other basic features like basic sort of ladder features. Um, it's also um, one of the little sort of things as we're sort of um, um, passionate tree huggers. We decided, okay, let's let's add a bit more interest in here and let's um, let's plant a tree for, for every um, new squash venue that's added and, and verified. So uh, that's a nice little uh, little bonus. Um, we partner with a company called Ecology in uh, in Bristol to uh, it's a, you know pretty cheap to, to plant a tree. So that that was just a nice little little add-on we've got there. Anyway, so I'm going to shift that out the way now. Um, and uh, yeah, showing you that um, I, I thought I'd uh, you know remind us here of the Open Active um, sort of charter here, so that I think um, this this sort of um, feed straight in or agree straight in with it, with this statement in the sense that um, you know it, obviously um, we, we understand that where you know where events are happening where courses are being published that that's that's the, the sort of the, the commercial end of of, um, of squash um, or, or sporting events rather um, but of course you know the, what it really starts with is okay where where are the venues where where are they and and again it was. Um, very lacking on a global scale as far as squash are concerned. That's that's a starting point as far as I'm concerned. Um, okay, so let's go across to here. I've shown you Flutter. I'm sure. Yeah, okay, this is our um, admin um, sort of dashboard backend um, powered by Laravel technology, if that um, anyone's ever heard of that. Um, so um, it, it, it all, um, the data in the, the backend, of course, is talking to the, the data that's added via the app. So we're all talking to the same central database. Um, so I come over to here, and this is this is me. I just um, th these are other suggestions coming in, um, which we can then reject or approve. So in this case, this is one I you know I just put in just now, so I can uh, open that up. Um, and in this case, I know it was wrong because I happen to know that Bournemouth University doesn't have any um, venues, so or squash courts rather. So I can um, reject new venue request. And I can give a reason. Um, it's question. Let me know. Add it as a trial. So that that now, yeah, just rejects that suggestion. So we've got that sort of little uh, human um, checking going on as well. Um, <clears throat> another important part of um, what we do is is the reporting. Very much so. So um, we happen to use. Um, I don't know if any of you use. Um, uh, uh, what they call BI tools um, for uh, reporting, like things like Tableau or Power BI. Uh, we happen to use Zoho Analytics. I, I found that just most intuitive to use. Um, so it means we can point to any data source and grab data and do lots of reporting as we like. 
Um, so, I mean, to give an example of the sort of general purpose things you can do with, with Zoho Analytics, you can point at any of these databases and a lot more, pull it in, all into one place, and then you can aggregate, run all, all sorts of reports. Um, <clears throat> and what that achieves is something like what you've got here, um, which is, so I'll show you the, the drop down here. We've got various reports and charts. So these, these reports and charts, again, are all generated by Zoho Analytics. And um, <clears throat> Um, they're about three hours delayed from, from the live data or up to three hours so that we, this, this uh, Zoho Analytics polls our central database every three hours, pulls it in and, and rebuilds the reports. Um, so, uh, but yeah, so we've got lots of reporting popping out um, both by country level, world level, and a whole bunch of sort of trivia reports coming out. Um, so yeah, you could obviously change this to, you can filter by all these different categories um, and it, it's churning out Courts being added, um, breakdowns by by Australian state. Um, again, this works for any any country in the system. Um, and of course, the, you know, the list of stats we could choose to report on is semi endless. Um, uh, contributors here, so we're acknowledging people who've been big contributors to the to the app. Um, this one here um, is showing uh, where we've got venues with an unknown number of courts. So our objective is for every venue that we've added, um, we want to know how many courts so we can get a proper um, understanding of um, courts per, per venue. Um, a typical average, I mean, if you average it right out across all the number of uh, venues, it's about three uh, on a global scale, about three courts per venue. So which means that we've got um, a total, if I go to here, let's go to world stats. We've got about six and a half thousand venues totally um, so far. So approximately, um, ballpark sort of 20,000 courts. Um, it's going to be very interesting to see how we go with, because um, yes, yeah, so, so that, that, court, that court number there is an undercount because, you know, we only, we only know of how many courts about 80% um, of our venues have. So um, yeah, probably more likely 20,000. I'm, I'm educated guess we've probably only got a couple of thousand courts to go on a global scale, which which, um, you know, I'm um, thinking about squash, but, uh, you know, it, it obviously has been like a lot of sports. Um, um, yeah, it had its, had its prime in the 80s and 90s, but uh, it's been struggling to, uh, you know, um, stay, stay viable, et cetera, like in the last couple of decades. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we've also got, of course, um, uh, you know, social media, that sort of thing. So we have a pretty active um, um, Facebook page. Uh, I, I don't do other social media. I haven't got time, unfortunately, um, to sort of get the community engaged. Um, and um, here's our here's our tree planting site with Ecology. So um, we've actually um, um, like so you can see here. So six and six thousand six hundred trees we've planted um, thanks to venues being added. Um, and um, we've actually uh, paused the subscription because the the rate at which new courts are being added is slowed right down because we've We've got all the low-hanging fruit, and um, yeah, the, the, we're we're still. You know, I, I believe there's quite a few left to get in, in USA because a lot of those venues are hidden inside um, uh, universities, colleges. Um, but um, yeah, we pause that, waiting for the number of venues to catch up. So hopefully, hopefully we can plant some more trees um, shortly. Um, so just just a quick um, recap. I can probably stop sharing now. Um, stop share. Right, I think I'm back. Um, yeah, so just a sort of a, a, a quick recap stroke overview. Um, so our, our, our principles of the app um, are mobile first, um, but never say never with a, with additional sort of uh, web-based tools. Um, obviously, you know, people, young young people today, of course, are all on, all about mobile devices. Um, we believe that um, you know crowdsourcing is. Um, you know, by far and away the most cost-effective way to build and maintain high-quality venue data. Um, so a bit like a little bit like Wikipedia for every, you know, one person who wants to muck around, 100 people want to fix it. Um, but of course, critical to that is com community engagement. Um, so you know, the community needs to know about the app, which is, is getting out there. So we're looking to, um, we're very variously partnering with sort of various squash bodies to, to make sure they recognize and, and they do um, this source as the authoritative source for squash venues. Um, and uh, we're definitely a big fan of the sort of level playing field thing. So, you know, it, um, I, I've been, I've traveled to many countries, I've had the good fortune in my time, and, and you know, I really have a, a feeling for 
um, making sure that we're not leaving the, the less wealthy um, countries behind. So I like the fact that we can um, we can level the playing field a bit in this regard. Um, and and you know, certainly um, we know what our beating heart is, which is this ability to crowdsource um, quality venue data. So um, you know, th this is not about becoming a you know squash um, sort of tournament software. It's not about competing with the incumbents and you know or squash training. It's about partnering um, with other people um, where we can have a sort of a win-win with um, with the uh, the sharing of what they do and what we do. Um, and, and of course, open data type initiatives all, all fit very nicely into that. Um, so in terms of uh, the future, we're looking to um, either, uh, we're at a bit of a crossroads in terms of where we go next, and that's partly subject to who we partner with and, and, and uh, um, you know where funding comes from. But uh, we, we certainly we can claim for other sports, um, looking to do, yeah, certainly strike up more partnerships um, and improving the whole variety of uh, facets of the the as is app that is about it hope that wasn't too too crazy and uh, too whirlwind thank you yeah thanks ross that was really interesting and um <laughs> yeah really interesting what i think we'll do is we'll listen to liz's uh talk about open places and then see if we've got some time for questions after that um but thank you. It was, it was really interesting. And it's, it's a really interesting way of collecting data about mm. sports venues. Um, so uh, next, I'm going to hand over to Liz Clark, who's going to uh, talk to us about uh, Active Places, which is uh, Sport England's uh, database of places. Um, Liz, uh, I'll hand over to you now. Great. Thanks, Andrew. And have you got the slides? I have got the slides. Yeah. There you go. Uh, just let me know when you want to move through them. Yep, I'll do my uh, best. Next slide, please. So, um, yeah, so as I uh, just said, so Active Places is a national sports facility database. Um, it's there um, as a strategic planning tool. It is free to access, um, uh, but primarily designed as a strategic facility planning tool, but the data is openly available and used in lots of other ways. So we've got two platforms associated with Active Places. Um, the first one is Active Places Power, which is where the users um, interact with the database. Um, so that's our mapping and reporting tool. And then there is a secondary platform, um, which is dedicated to ensuring the data quality um, and maintaining the data in the database. So that's our self-service platform, and that's used by our site owners and our data validation team. So if we could go on to the next slide. So um, Active Places Power is that front end. It's where users go. It's where our tools and, um, and all of the tools are reporting to create that evidence base are uh, based. Um, when you get these slides, that picture on the right of the brochure is clickable. So that should take you through to our brochure. Um, but the questions there on the screen are the types of questions that Active Places Power can help you to answer. So how many are there? Where are sports halls? Um, what is the catchment? But they are just some of the questions. Um, there are a lot more. So if we go on to the next slide. So there's a variety of tools and um, reports within the database, they really are helping to answer the what. So what is there in terms of sports facility? Um, the where, so the locations, there's a lot of mapping in there. And we do also have a lot of reporting to support the who. So I've got some examples there of where we're looking at which populations can reach facilities, for example. If we go on to the next slide. So with Active Places Power, there is you can you can see that the platform is having two ways in, if you like. So we do have open data feeds. So you can use our APIs to access the um, database, or you can download the the open components of the database as well, and that's in JSON or CSV. So it is possible to just come and take that open data. We would recommend that if you do that that you um, register for the platform, because as soon as you register for the platform, then we can send you um, breaking change notifications. 
So we will always notify you if we're going to make changes to those APIs in case you do have important system dependencies. The web interface, so that's where most of our users will go. Um, that's a you register. It's free to register. The reason we add the registration step is it allows us to um, confirm who's using the platform, to understand our users, to communicate with our users, but it also helps us to protect the platform as well and just um, fish out those um, spam uh, type uh, registrations. So within the web interface, that's where you're going to go for your tools. That's where you're going to really be able to access the database and really be able to interrogate it and generate reports and maps. Um, if we go on to the next slide. So this is an example of the types of data that is held within the database. Um, so how the database is organized is at the highest level, we have a site. So as an example here, I've got K2, um, which is a leisure center in Crawley. And at the top of the, the page, as we're seeing it here, um, we're getting a description all about that site. So it's contact details, uh, the amenities, disability access, all of that site level geography. Each site then owns a set of facilities and it has multiple facilities. Facilities are organized by um, a facility type and then a facility subtype. So for example, the facility type might be grass pitches, but the facility subtypes would be football pitches versus uh, rugby pitches. Each facility has its own set of attributes. Um, so I'm showing an example there of an artificial grass pitch. Um, there are a set of common attributes. So for every facility, we will record whether it's operational, who um, operates it, whether you can access it, type of access, so pay and pay, private, sports club, will record information on its build history and also disability access, because the disability access for a facility might be different to the site as a whole. Each facility then has a set of facility specifics. So these are things that describe that facility, but um, a kind of specific to that facility. So for example, we want to record different things about an artificial grass pitch, then we do a swimming pool. So in the case of the um, artificial grass pitch, what we're recording are the number of pitches, um, whether it's flood lit. With a swimming pool, we're gonna record things like length, width, depth, mood of a wall, floor. So slightly different facility specific. Um, I've put a link there at the bottom to um, the open data page for that site. Um, so you can explore the record um, for that particular site. It's got a good mix of facilities and it'll give you an indication of the types of data we record. If we go on to the next slide, please. So these are some of the examples and I'm, this is gonna be a very whistle stop tour of the different reports. Um, the brochure will give you more information and then register and have a play really, you can't break it. Um, so with the reports, uh, this is our detailed report. The detailed report allows you to interrogate the database, identify the sites and facilities you're interested and then take that away as an Excel. So you can take that Excel, it's got all of the attributes in and you can generate your own reports. So that's the detailed report. That's our most commonly used report. If we go on to the next slide. The other set of tools we have in there, we have a series of calculators. So the calculators are designed to look at demand. So they're gonna be able to help answer questions like how much additional demand for swimming might the population of a new development generate? Um, it will also help to understand the likely cost of meeting that demand. Um, these are used, for example, by our planning team to bring money into sports. Uh, into the sports sector um, as part of the planning process. These calculators, you have to be really careful and remember that they only look at demand. So they are not looking at supply. Um, and that is an important part of that question and that equation. We do have another model, the facilities planning model. It's not accessible through this um, through Active Places Power, but it helps um, local authorities understand the whole concept of the demand and the supply. 
If we move on to the next slide. So there's lots of mapping tools within Active Places. And as the head of GIS, I always get excited when we get on the mapping tools. Um, these are all interactive and they generate as on the fly so as you're creating that query. Um, the kind of questions that the tools will answer, how many people are within a 20 minute bike ride of a site? How many people could walk to a proposed site? If I look at my population within my local authority, which populations can't walk to a swimming pool, for example? There's a, a huge range of questions. They're all network generated. So we've got a network in there built on roads, footpaths, cycleways, and all of these types of questions are routing along those networks. So we're looking at a true um, route rather than um, straight line distances. These kind of tools are really useful to understand who can access a facility. As an NGB, I might be looking um, at uh, introducing a new program at a site and I want to understand who, who can reach that site. Can my target demographics reach that site, for example? If we go on to the next slide. And there is also just a whole bunch of mapping in there as well. Um, so you can access maps that help you um, ex explore that spatial context of a site. So there's aerial photography, there's um, supporting data sets like IMD, which is the one we've got there, and there are a range of base maps as well. So lots to explore. If we go on to the next slide. And then these are the APIs. So. What I showed you previously, that's the nice uh, user interface where uh, you can generate reports and really interact with the data. And this is what the APIs look like. Uh, well, this is to be a bit more readable. Um, these are meant for more system integrations. So um, if you have a system and you want to um, pull Active Places data into that, the APIs would allow you um, to do that. And all of the data that I've mentioned in all of those reports is available through the APIs. If we go on to the next slide. So really, we've got all of these reports, we've got these APIs, but what's fundamental is ensuring that the data behind them is accurate. And we spend a lot of time um, looking at the active places data and maintaining that data. So it's a massive database. There are around 42,000 sites of 115,000 facilities within the database. They are, those facilities are classified into 15 broad facility types. So artificial grass pitches, sports halls, swimming pools, um, squash courts uh, we have in there. We have um, 15 of these facility types and it's soon to be 16. So it's constantly growing and we're looking to add more facilities and facility types. All of our sites and facilities are identifiable via a unique ID. So we have this common language of a site ID and a facility ID. And we're working with NGBs to, to ensure that we, we all talk with that same ID so we know where we're talking about. The database is constantly being updated. Um, so I've got daily updates there, but it's actually, it can update it. The, the team are constantly working to update it. How do we keep the data up to date? So we have um, a dedicated data validation team. So that's a team of, um, it fluxes, but a core team of five, and it can expand up to 10, um, that are solely dedicated to updating and maintaining that data. We also have our site owners as well. So it is possible if you own a site to take ownership of it within the platform and maintain the record yourself, being supported. So what the data validation team are doing is that they're constantly auditing sites. So we have a rolling annual audit. So they're working um, to uh, contact a site, run through their full record, verify that it's correct. And they'll do some of those today, some tomorrow, and they keep going with the aim of contacting each site once a year. So that equates to around 2,000 phone calls a month. 
we also action any update as soon as we are um, notified. So we're constantly working to try and put in these feedback loops to ensure that if anyone's using the Active Places data, they're able to contact us and tell us where an update is required. And that's something that we're working on a lot at the moment to try and automate that and get some, um, yeah, these automated kind of feedback loops in to allow us to really streamline that update process. So on the whole, we think it's very accurate. We're constantly working is it it's there as a resource for the sector and it is published and I've, I've got the open data license there so i think the last side really is just to emphasize that this really is it's owned by spot england but it's really about the community and we couldn't um, keep the data up to date without the support of our users our site owners leisure providers ngbs so we're all working to maintain that um, data within active places I think that was me. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. That was uh, really interesting. Uh, and and uh, I, I think the contrast between uh, Ross's presentation and the data that he showed us that is crowdsourced and the kind of Sport England approach uh, where you are uh, kind of managing data in a, perhaps a slightly more controlled way. Maybe that's not the right term. Sorry, Ross. Uh, it's really interesting. Um, so I think we've got a little bit of time for questions. So if anyone's got any questions for either Ross or Liz, do you want to stick your hand up or put something in the chat? Uh, Charlie. Yeah, thank you. Liz, really, really interesting and helpful. I've been aware of Active Places for a long time, but um, it's definitely cropping up on a, in an almost daily conversation at Playfinder at the moment. So um, really useful to um, get that get that summary. Just a really novice question that I'm sure I could find if I did a quick Google or, or went onto the website, but do, do you identify a space on a facility um, any differently in your site and facility ID um, language? And by a space, I mean a 3G pitch potentially being broken down into a, a single full-size pitch um, or three, three thirds, four quarters of smaller um, five side and other sized um, spaces? It would depend on the facility, but no, uh, uh, in general, it's the facility as a whole. So we would have a record for the AGP and we would know the number of pitches on it. We wouldn't know how they were marked out. Another example might be a sports hall. So we would have a, an attribute that said that there are four badminton courts within the sports hall so we might have that there's four badminton courts and um over marking for football and basketball but we can't tell you how they all relate so we can't tell you which ones you could do at the same time if that makes sense it does absolutely yeah. i'm really used to the shared facility knowledge so that you never have a full pitch booked while you've got a third of a pitch being used so you don't get a duplicate booking um yeah. no, that's really useful i mean to give you a, a sense of of our work we're, we're actually making sure um at the moment that through our onboarding processes when we on onboard new venues and facilities onto our book tech booking system that we capture um, active places IDs and store them in our back end so that we've got a connection into into active places one of the medium to long-term views there we can already do this with, with our venue data anyway is to be able to report with our venue partners and strategic partners um, the kind of social impact of a particular venue or facility um, so we know what participation looks like we know bookings we know those bookers so we know the IMD score of the people who are booking and using those venues and facilities and um, so it's a really nice crossover with your imd data there as well but it really gives us a good sense uh, with those we work with of, of yeah the social social impact of uh, participation and the local community engagement of a, of a venue so just really interesting to see that crossover as well yeah that sounds really interesting and great to hear that you're using the site ids um and again happy to discuss if ever you your your users identify that their active places site record isn't quite right how you can feed that back to us. Um, but also if you have sites or facilities that you want to add that you don't have an active places site ID, again, we would add, we kind of look at adding them into the database so we can establish a feedback so that you can say to us, okay, we've been approached by this school and it's not on your um, thing, could you add it? And we do that with um, uh, other organizations and NGBs as well. So 
yeah, yeah. it'll be interesting with like new venues. So I can see the Football Foundation's logo on the page, like their investment in play zone sites where a lot of new new build uh, pitches are going in, as well as refurbs. So some of those new builds will probably quantify new pitches there that would need a new site ID and facility. Like. Yeah, exactly. And we work closely with the foundation to get those onto the system because it, it it our data is picked up into their uh, pitch finder system. So for it to appear in pitch finder, it has to be on our system. So we have that feedback loop with them. Yeah, worth um, you'll you'll probably notice we we've got a pilot contract that has the ability to grow to those first the sort of three hundred sites over the next three years. So there'll definitely be another connectivity of that relationship, I suspect, between the foundation, um, pitch finder, and, and play finder and book tech. So we'll be, that'll be worth exploring at some point to make sure there isn't a, a crack that we we find. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, did anyone have any other questions for Liz or Ross? I saw a hand flash up, maybe uh, Baden. Hey, um, thanks, Ross. Thanks, Liz. Uh, great presentations on both of those. Um, Liz, I just wanted to ask a couple of questions about the active uh, places side of that. Um, and apologies if you covered these and I, and I missed it. Um, I was just hoping I'm going to ask all the very basic Paralympics GB style questions here. Um, how how does the disabled community get factored into that with respect to um, you were mentioning about the planning aspects where that brings back um, how many people can cycle in, um, you know, how many people are within a walking radius of that. Um, does it go any deeper to look at facilities such as accessible transport, uh, those kind of things? Um, so, yeah, just how the, the disabled community are more factored into uh, into that program, please. Yeah, so at the moment with our catchment analysis, it is walking and cycling um, access um, and we parameterize those. They're not, so for example, with the cycling, it's not like a clad cyclist type speeds, it's um, your more commuter type speeds or not, probably not even commuter type speeds. Um, so we, we try and factor that in. Um, we don't unfortunately have anything there around um, accessible transport to two sites. Um, we're at a site, we at the site and the facility, we record disability kind of access. Um, so whether there's changing places, whether there's ramps, um, whether there's wide doorways, so all of that kind of facility attributes as to whether the site is going to be accessible and the facility is going to be accessible um, is recorded uh, within the database. Okay, cool. Um, for things like swimming pools, are you recording um, hoists or ramps, uh, whether it's got like a, a fully ramped entry, those kind of things, are they all recorded? And yeah. are they separate sets of data, so to speak, or are they all recorded under one? So we've just done some work with um, hoists, actually. Um, so we used to record hoist at the site level, um, but that actually made it incredibly tricky because you knew there was a hoist at the site, but you didn't know which swimming pool it may or may not be attached to. Um, so what we have just done, in, and we, we did that in December, was we moved the hoist uh, information down into the swimming pool so that it's actually attached to the facility itself. Now, what that means is if you went in the database at the moment, you might find a lot of don't know. And that's because in effect, we've now got to recollect all of that information because we used to know that there was a hoist at the site, but we now don't know where that hoist relates in terms of if it's got multiple pools. So we are now gradually working through contacting all of our swim sites and working our way through all of the swimming facilities to populate that hoist information at the pool level. Um, and it, it will take us a little while to contact each of the sites to populate that. Yeah, no we doubt. also have an item on our pipeline because um, we've always got a pipeline for active places. So there is an item on our pipeline to look at um, the recording because we've been doing some work recently with um, Swim England and we want to ensure that we are capturing hoists, lifts in the right way um, and, and pods, I think. So they have a slightly different way of recording within Swim England. Um, so we are looking at, OK, can we capture some of the data in a slightly different way because using the word hoist might not be quite right so that's on that's, our pipeline that's really good to hear yeah that was going to be my follow-on question whether or not that was going to be separated out into the different types of um, mobility aids to help people get into the pool so that's that's really really good to hear 
Are there yeah. any plans uh, back to the kind of um, geography side or the topography side of how it's mapping that ability for people to access um, from the local area to the facility? Um, when you were saying about uh, the cycling not being lycra-clad cycling, but more your, your kind of recreational cyclist, um, does, and this, this may not be the right question, but does it take into account things like the topography or the, uh, the geography of the sites, where if it's completely all uphill, um those kind of factors that you know that kind of impacts the the travel time um but also yeah. whether or not then you have plans to maybe look at how that might affect people from the disabled community actually accessing that site so i can tell you from pushing my mum who's in a wheelchair all the way up a hill that that yeah. takes a lot longer than that if i was on a bike longer. yeah exactly no at the moment it doesn't we don't have topography in there um but we have data sets for topography um and we use the Ordnance Survey data, and I know they're currently working on their routes as well. Um, so again, that's something that I can put on our pipeline, um, is that better reflection. Um, and I'll take this away now, actually. We're always looking for ideas for the pipeline. So I'll take away now and put on our pipeline, right, we need something around um, accessible transport. We need something about um, topography, how easy it is to get to a site. Um, so yeah, I'll add that to our pipeline. That sounds great, Liz. Um, and if you want to grab a chat separately at any point, happy to completely mind dump all the ideas and you can filter through uh, that mess that comes out for sure. But yeah, great to hear they're all ideas that you've got on the plate. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. We'll put them on the pipeline. Um, just to, to flag Active Places is currently about to start a redevelopment. So we're redeveloping the whole of Active Places, the whole ecosystem from the ground up. In terms of the data, it will be maintained and accessible throughout and the platforms will be as well. Um, but we're just that redevelopment is about bringing it all onto new technologies to support some of these types of questions that haven't been possible on our current technologies. But that does mean that uh, we've got a little bit of a way to go before we can start looking at our pipeline, because at the moment we're rebuilding everything. So we're going to rebuild and then we'll get onto the pipeline. So uh, thanks, Liz. Yeah, yeah. Big project by the sounds of it. It I'm, is. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to be really mean and cut the conversation off there, I'm afraid. And I, I feel really bad doing that. I think, I think the one thought that's buzzing around in my head now is how do we get the activity finders to draw through all of this wonderful data that's in, in active places when they present results to users so users know what they're, they're coming to the site. Um, Charlie, uh, I'm going to come to you next to give us a quick five minute update on the steering committee, if that's all right. You're quiet, Charlie. I don't know why. Oh, sorry. I thought I had pressed on mute, uh, but my clicker didn't work. Um, hopefully you can hear me now. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, thanks, everyone. I'll try and keep this to a few minutes. So we have a few minutes left for, for AOB and discussion at the end. Um, steering committee met uh, yesterday for two and a half hours. Uh, it's a monthly meeting as a reminder. Um, we had two main topics of conversation yesterday. Um, the first topic was uh, to discuss for about 45 minutes to an hour of the meeting um, what the strategic priorities of Open Active look like for the short, medium and long term. Um, it's often asked even by the steering committee um, what short, medium and long term mean um, to make sure we've got definitions of those periods where really the only timeline we have to a period is the current phase, which is one year taking us through to the end of December um, of the, um, the grant between the ODI and Sports England. Um, in this case, I'll, I'll surmise that short term is the current grant period. Um, medium term um, probably indicates the next two to three years and long term is a period of which we probably struggle to put a time frame around it. Um, so uh, the blue sky thinking for the future um, but perhaps looking at a more five to six year uh, life cycle. Um, it was quite a creative session um, uh, for the call itself. So um, for those familiar with Jamboarding or Jamboard, um, it's in a sort of digital sticky notes model um, where steering committee were looking to add what goals and su what uh, success looks like onto sticky notes for each of those periods, worked through for about 10 minutes each. Um, so um, uh, without wanting to discuss the specifics of um, the outcomes of that, what the actions were, were to add all those goals and sticky notes for what success looks like for short, medium and long term. And the ODI have taken an action away kindly to um, sort of document that in a more readable, digestible form so we can discuss sort of prioritisation of those strategic priorities um, and make sure there's actions around um, 
um, achieving them. Uh, I would hope, I uh, don't want to put anyone on the spot here, Julie, I'd welcome you coming forward if you want to to comment on when, when if we were to publish it, publish more information on that, but I suspect there will be an ambition from steering committee in the ODI once we've managed to, to document and then discuss at the steering committee, perhaps at the next session or, or one after that in, in April or May, um, that that could be something that's later published um, in the in the community. But as I said, I don't want to put someone on the spot because we, we haven't had a chance to discuss the kind of second and third follow on steps from that particular session. Uh, Andrew, do you want to step in on that if there's anything you want to add? Uh, no, I, I, I need to do a bit of work with Julie to work out exactly how long it will take us to do that. Um, and yeah, I think we will bring something back to a future steering committee. Uh, the April committee is already looking quite busy, so it'll probably be the May committee when we come back with our kind of summary and proposal. Perfect. Um, uh, and then the second and most perhaps most important topic of conversation um, was about designing the future organizational model for open active. So um, uh, some of you will have uh, seen and kindly engaged with the uh, community survey um, that was out through the month of March um, and a town hall that I believe happened on the, around the 10th of March, second or third week of March. Um, uh, which was to collect community feedback on the process to define that um, uh, future organisational model. Um, so again, this is one of the work streams of phase five that the ODI are leading, um, and hopefully it's explicit what it says, but what, what uh, to remind everyone of how Open Active is um, uh, organisationally set up today, um, Open Active is a, is a defined project um, that uh, is hosted within uh, the ODI that the ODI then work on as with a, ded with a dedicated team for which we've obviously got a couple of members with us today um, and much of that work is funded through the grant that Sport England uh, are kindly funding as the as the sole current sole funder um, so what this is about is looking to the future to go is that the um, uh, operating model that the steering committee and the community want for open active um, and if not what might other um, options look like to be discussed so um, the ODI work stream has taken into account looking at other similar um, uh, open data kind of uh, initiatives and environments um, which several case studies have been looked at and documented to see what look at those op operating models look at their business models um, uh, so we can infer learnings from those to, to bring into to the future operating model of open open active um, they we've taken the community survey into account as well as the town hall um, and turn that into the best qualitative and quantitative data we can um, to steer insights from the community i think an important note that this as a community-led initiative um, that uh, the community's opinion is right at the heart of um, what the future operating model might look like. Um, and the third sort of uh, vertical of that is taking um, a formal legal advice on what the future operating model might look like and the, the impacts, advantage, advantages and disadvantages of the different options. And I guess the impacts on things like business models, commercialization, um, et cetera, that each of those would, would have a, an impact to, including where future funding might come from that might not be from um, solely Sport England and, and the restrictions or, or non-restrictions of that. Um, the three um, options that are, are on the table um, and on table for discussion, uh, and I would add with this, it's layers and layers of complexity, but um, uh, there are lots of different ways Open Active could and would look uh, even within these models. So this is perhaps an oversimplification, but one, one option is to continue as a project that is hosted within the Open Data Institute. Um, another option discussed is for Open Active to become an independent subsidiary um, of, an, of an existing organization, which could uh, be the Open Data Institute, but could well be a, a another third party organization. Um, and the third option is for Open Active to become a new standalone um, independent company. Um, I think I would speak to these companies generally likely to be um, uh, non for profit organizations or charities, as the as it being the general, but not want to go into the detail of that quite at this point. Um, so the report, as I say, looks at the advantages and disadvantages of those three, um, consider the business models, restrictions and community view. Um, to summarise the conversation yesterday, um, a decision taken, uh, that being the first discussion by the steering committee on the, the report and the recommendations from the ODI's work, um, was to continue as um, we are today for the time being. Um, uh, and for the time being, we're really talking about phase, phase five, so hosted as a project within the ODI. Um, th there was a planned month of work in the month of April to 
uh, considered the roadmap for implementing the model that was decided on in that meeting, uh, because it was inappropriate to, to rush to a, such a major decision in one session. Um, uh, we also decided, voted on and decided that that month of work, instead of being used to map out the roadmap on the decided model, is to map out the roadmap for uh, move, look, the, the view to moving to an independent subsidiary of another organisation. Um, uh, so the third option of a, of a new standalone independent company is, is considered not in scope at the moment. It would be too much of a risk for Open Active to move to a completely standalone model where we, we've only got one single funder and the sustainability of that is not, um, not certain for the long term. Um, so the, the other option that is definitely considered in scope but um, uh, needs to be given more consideration is moving to an independent subsidiary with its own board etc um, of another organization that perhaps being the ODI and so a roadmap for making that move is being mapped out so that we can compare the two options as a steering committee um, of uh, staying hosted within the ODI as a project or moving to an independent subsidiary under the ODI um, against each other considering the advantages and disadvantages before any further decisions are made. Um, so I've definitely gone on longer because I've hit the half hour mark, but that was probably quite a hard one to summarise while keeping uh, the community up to speed with uh, the, all of the steering committees, conversations, discussions and decisions. Um, but hopefully that's uh, uh, the best summary I can give. Uh, thank you, Charlie. That, that summary uh, was really good, actually. And I think it uh, set out the, the discussions at the steering committee really clearly. So thank you for that. Uh, we don't have time for questions on that now, but I, I would suggest if anyone does have any questions on either of those items we use the slack channel to have a discussion around those offline um i'd andrew i'd add to that that the minutes of the meeting will obviously be published by by julie in the coming weeks and um julie will be kindly sending out a comms as to where those minutes are being published on the open active website that the odi have done some great work in making more uh, easily available so um uh, if you do want to see more you should be able to see that in the minutes soon enough yeah. Excellent, thank you. Um, so uh, I think all that remains for me to do is to, I'm going to skip AOB because of time, but I think it rem all it remains for me to do uh, is to thank everyone for joining today, a uh, particular thanks to Ross and Liz and Charlie for presenting and I hope everyone's found that a valuable session uh, and we'll see you in two weeks time for the next AEF. Thank you very much everyone.